Yeah, you. If you belong to God, you're blessed. But there's more to the story. Let's talk about it with Larry Dixon on Steve Brown, etc. He's, he's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad you're here. I know you get tired of me saying it, but one should never get tired of truth. We always have a place at our table for you. And in case you're wondering, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Border, our executive producer, is here. Matthew is on a weight loss journey. Uh, kind of like the Israelites were on a journey, too. <laughs> Any day now. Any day now. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, could be. Starts. Uh, Has the quail dropped from heaven yet? <laughs> yeah, Matthew? i got to lay off the quail and the manna. <laughs> the quail is okay. Our producer, Jinx, is in the little glass booth. Jinx reminds you that every zoo is a petting zoo if you can run fast <laughs> enough. <laughs> and I don't have to run faster than there. I only have to run faster than you. Yeah. <laughs> That's the funniest line you've All ever right. written. I just want you to know Expect that. Expect to see that several more times. Yeah. <laughs> Our one-man IT department, John Myers, is in the tech bunker. John, I know you like Star Wars, so as Gandalf might say, long live and pro Oh, that wasn't. That's, well, it's close same enough. I'm old. I'm doing it's, the best I can. There's right. two old movies that nobody cares about. <laughs> I think he Fine. said, I'll be back. Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life, and he's not here. George says a man's got to believe in something. I believe I'll have another cup of Cuban coffee. Uh, his wife had surgery, and she's doing fine. Had it yesterday, and yep. he decided that the better part would be to stay. I told him if he's he a, loved Jesus, he would be here, but and fortunately, it didn't work. He's wiser than that. Right where he needs to be. <laughs> and that was the voice of Kathy Wyatt, who is the soft feminine side of the program. Kathy makes sure that everything here at Key Life is in apple pie order. <laughs> oh, Matthew. <laughs> that makes me hungry. Me too. <laughs> I know. Okay. You haven't baked anything recently. Have no, you not been feeling well? Actually, I have baked a lot recently. But for, for others. Us. And but not for, for yeah, us. Are you no, feeling not worse? You, uh, no. Uh, uh, yeah. We got a great guest today. His name is Larry Dixon, but if you treat him properly, it's Dr. Larry Dixon. He's a professor emeritus. That means they pay him some money for hanging around, but he doesn't have to do much. <laughs> Having been there and done that, I understand that, and he doesn't have to grade the way. That, grading is like going to the dentist for three days and him never stop grinding on your teeth. And Larry is in much better mood than he was when he was a full-time professor. He's Professor Emeritus at Columbia International University, Seminary and School of Missions in Columbia, South Carolina. Spends a considerable portion of his time overseas teaching students and mentoring Ph.D. students. He's taught the doctrines of the Christian faith to undergraduate seminary and church audiences for more than 20 years, and he's authored more than a dozen books. Every time he burps, they publish it, and numerous articles. Larry's latest book is called Blessed, and you got to spell it right, and we'll find out why in a minute. It's not B-L-E-S-S-E-D. But B L E S S dash E D. 52 weekly blessings you have as a believer and how to help your lost friends find theirs. Larry, thanks for taking this time with us. Appreciate that. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Um, you know, I can't, 
when I saw the title of your book, and we got it a while ago, I, and I had the manuscript before it was published, uh, I couldn't help but think of Bing Crosby. And when he was singing, I think, to Rosemary Clooney in White Christmas, if you are whatever and can't sleep, just count your blessings instead of sheep. Larry, I expect that you're going to fix me on this program. I'm a cynical old preacher, and I don't always see the glass as half full. You know, I always see it as half empty. And uh, I've been working, and I told Larry this off the air on a sermon for the church I attend. My pastors are doing a series on James. And they asked me to participate and to do a passage in James 5 on patience. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, said to, I, said, I said to my pastor, that's like asking me to do a sermon on how to grow hair. Are you crazy? I can't do this. But anyway, that passage um, contains some pretty negative stuff about you should be patient when you're at the dentist's. And uh, I found a principle in that passage clearly taught that you can stand hell if you're going to get out. <laughs> but but uh, your book is going to clean out my soul. I really do need to be fixed, don't I, Larry? I think we all need to be fixed, Steve. We all have a lot of issues. But I think you're exactly right. We need to count our blessings. And it would have put a t totally different spin I think on everyday life, if we do. Do you? Um, why did you write "blessed" the way you did? Did you have a drunk editor who missed it, <laughs> or tell us about that? Well, my primary editor is myself, and mm -hmm. I'm not admitting any uh, <laughs> any such uh, sin. Um, I guess I wanted to draw attention to the fact that a lot of us. Meet people, salespeople who say, you know, how are you doing? And they'll say, I'm blessed. And I thought, you know, it's such a term that's thrown around a lot. And I'd rather think of it in terms of two syllables. I'm really blessed. How have I been blessed by God? You know, what has he done in my life? Um, and I just think sometimes we trivialize words like that. And so it's a little bit of an attention getter, I hope. I think it is. I, it, it certainly got my attention uh, when I first saw it. Uh, caused me to rethink and repent <laughs> from my negative attitude about things. We, you know, this book's it's certainly for believers like me, and it reminds us that God has been very kind and merciful and good to us beyond, as Art DeMoss used to say, anything that I ever deserved. Uh, but this book's not just for unbelievers, is it? Yeah, I, exactly. I, I wrote it primarily because of a relationship that I have with an, a, a, an older gentleman, a few years older than me, uh, that I call Mike in the book. That's not his name. But he basically said to me one day when I was sharing the gospel with him, uh, Larry, don't worry about me. I'm going to be fine with God. And the more I thought about what he said and the fact that he had not trusted Christ as a savior, um, it was obvious to me he's not going to be fine with God. He does not have salvation through the Lord Jesus. And I got to thinking, what else does he not have? Or to put it positively, what do I have as a believer that I have only because of Christ? And my friend Mike doesn't yet have those things because he's not repented and trusted the Lord. So that was really the genesis of the book. By the way, uh, I don't know if he's older than you. He may be dead but you should have referred to him as your former friend. You were not kind in the things you said. And if initially he was upset, man, he's never going to speak to you again. But at least you changed his name, and that was a pretty wise uh, move. Well, and I'm not going to give him a copy of the book because <laughs> each, of, each of those 52 blessings talks about what he does not have if he is not in Christ. And I don't apologize for that. I think we need to tell the truth. But it's interesting, just a week ago, um, my wife and I were up in New Jersey and actually had dinner with him and his girlfriend. He's in his 80s. And uh, 
Holy got into an, yeah, we got into an over two hour discussion about the gospel. So it was yeah. a real, very positive time. Oh, good. Do you think sometimes, well, I will have to ask you this on the other side of the break. You can answer it yes or no. But sometimes when you look at Christians, this is not exactly, uh, we're not exactly poster children for being blessed. Uh, somebody has said that unbelievers go through heaven to get to hell and believers go through hell in order to get to heaven. That's not true, is it? No, I think that's a good point. It reminds me of a great book a few years ago that was entitled No More Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's our 11th commandment to be nice. No, it's really not. And we're going to talk about that on the other side of the break. The book is Blessed by Larry Dixon, and I hold it in my nicotine-stained hands. And if you... If you get depressed easily, if you have my proclivity to look at the half-filled jar, uh, you need this book. It'd be a great book to study in a small group at your church, but maybe good medicine for you to remind you of how good and kind and merciful and generous God has been to you. Hey, listen. Don't go anywhere like Jesus. We're coming back. Professor and author Larry Dixon. His latest book is called Bless Ed, 52 Weekly Blessings You Have as a Believer and How to Help Your Lost Friends Find Theirs. I, uh, before the break, I brought up a quote. If I knew who said it, I would tell you. I just can't remember. But somebody has said that most Christians believe that unbelievers go through heaven in order to get hell. In other words, you're going to get yours. And that believers go through hell in order to get to heaven. Uh, that is spurious and just not true. But maybe the first part is true, but the second part certainly isn't. Do you think sometimes we're so focused on heaven that we miss the blessings that are ours right now in time and space? Oh, I think that's definitely true. And um, I, the very first book that I wrote, Stephen, was called uh, The Other Side of the Good News, A Defense of Jesus Teaching on Hell. God, and That must it, have been a bestseller, I, I'm sure. <laughs> I, well, yeah, and I took on a few t leading evangelicals that were... Um, uh, shilly shallying on the doctrine of eternal conscious punishment and did my best to refute them. But uh, so thankful that uh, Christ bore my punishment and I don't have to worry about hell. But of course, that's a great blessing to know that because of his finished work on the cross, I, I don't need to fear God's eternal wrath, but his eternal wrath is a reality. And we do need to, to talk about that from time to time. And we often don't. You uh, wrote a book shortly after that on heaven, didn't you? I did, yeah. Well, it balances out <laughs> in terms of sale. I'm sure the publisher was pleased. <laughs> Larry, you know, the uh, subtitle is 52 Weekly Blessings You Have as a Believer and How to Help Your Lost Friends Find Theirs. I don't know if you made this connection. There's 52 weeks in a year. That's really, that's really works out nicely. So, you know, one <laughs> might even think about starting their week with one of these every week. So... Um, I wonder if you speak to the structure because I like it's it's the same in every one and I don't know I just like I like finding uh, a template and a structure that works and makes sense. So you you mention a blessing and then there's a section called the blessing. There's a section called the Bible and then there's action steps. Kind of talk to us about how one might you know put this to work when they're reading it. Sure. Um, 
I, I've written other devotional books, but this one I was just burdened to write something with a bit more substance. And so in a sense, it's, it's designed to be read one devotional per week. Uh, if you look at the end of each devotional, there are some pretty hefty assignments, including read such and such a book or study Psalm 119 and write out 50, uh, 50 benefits of God's word, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And each of those action steps concludes with a prayer for your lost friend. So my my burden in that book is not just to say uh, Christians um, bask in what you have in knowing Jesus. No, it's know what you have in Jesus and pray intelligently for your lost friend that somehow you communicate some of those blessings to him or her and they will get interested. So in that sense, it was designed to be one devotional per week, but I've got friends that that they violated that whole principle and read more than one. So that's okay. Those rascals. <laughs> Larry, I want to bring up the um, the age thing. Um, I skipped that chapter, by the uh, way. They, yeah, I know you did. There is no blessing to being old. I know. I know you period. did. Period. I did have to. I, I did have to tell you though. He tells this great little story about. Um, so you need to tell it, Larry, because I, 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 I don't want to ruin it. It probably is funnier when you tell it about your wife and and her creating the emoji, um, and and what you and what you said and and um, obviously you lived through it. But anyway, um, what, a statement that you make in there is. Um, that, uh, where you say, forget about aging gracefully, instead focus on aging gratefully. I got to tell you, I I think I have a harder problem with aging gratefully than graciously. Because, um, uh, well, I don't need to go into it, but it's, it's pretty pretty hard to, to be grateful about, about age. Um and I'm not somebody who who has a lot of physical problems, which a number of people that I know do. And obviously that, you know, that makes it even more difficult. But um, it is it is different. And and as you watch your life change and watch the things that you previously were able to do and now you can't do and or shouldn't do in some cases, um, you know, I think it's I think it's kind of it's kind of difficult. So talk to us about old, but tell the story first. Yeah, tell the story about your wife and the emoji, because it's a great story. <laughs> Even well, though I as... suspect, Larry, I suspect it's <laughs> embellished a bit, but it is a funny story. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to embellish it at all. I'll tell it exactly the way it happened. Both my wife and I are in our 70s, and she discovered the uh, the the way to create your own little emoji, your little character that you can use when you text someone. And she found a cute picture of a, a young lady with uh, her style of hair and uh, eyeglasses and, and smile and all the rest and asked me what I thought. And I said to her, well, I like it, but don't you want to add some wrinkles? Um, <laughs> I, don't re I don't remember Bad much move. of that. I, I don't remember where I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a good experience. <laughs> But, that is, that is know, true. That is true. Those emojis are, you know, it's like you can, all you can do with them is add gray hair, and that's it. <laughs> By the way, I uh, talked to a pastor uh, just uh, just last week who was 95 years old, a former uh, Navy pilot. And uh, I said, you know, I like talking to you. I don't know anybody who's as old as you are who's still alive except me. <laughs> you know, we Wait a minute. Us. He's going to finish that. I, we, I interrupted him when yeah, I said I the emoji Keep talking thing. about old. Yeah. Well, we just recently visited my wife's mom, who just turned 97, and she is in an assisted living situation, but her mind is as clear as day, and, and I encourage her as she's a witness to people who are, they're very much in their last chapter of their lives. Um, and she looks for opportunities to share the gospel with the other inmates, I mean residents, <laughs> in the assisted living place. But, yeah, I, you know, I, I think we can regret um, years going by, and they seem to be going by faster and faster the older I get. But I'm also thankful that there's a new chapter that awaits us where we can be used by the Lord and encouraging others, discipling others, and simply being a witness. So I'm happy for that. I agree with that, and I'm being facetious when I talk. I love this age. I really do. I can um, I can say things, and people uh, don't get angry anymore. I mean, I say really weird things. 
And I spoke at a graduation at a university this year, and I said, you're very fortunate to have me. And the reason you're fortunate to have me is that I'm old as dirt. And I don't care what you think, so I'm going to tell you the truth. If you want to know the truth about anything, talk to an old person. They don't want anything from you, and they'll tell you the truth. If they're Christians, they'll even be nice about it. Well, enough about that. The title of the book, and we're going to talk about it more, so don't go anywhere. This is good stuff. Larry Dixon, Blessed. Um, and it's uh, a bunch, uh, one you can do every week as you consider uh, that week how you're blessed. Id. Professor and author Larry Dixon. And you can keep up with him at LarryDixon.wordpress.com. Larry, in the book, you talk about consistently, you know, this idea of um, friendship, evangelism. And you talked earlier about your friend Mike. I know growing up in Baptist Church, uh, a big part of what we learned was evangelism explosion. And I think you knew yeah. Dr. Kennedy and it's it's great. It, there's a structure, and if you met some stranger, you have kind of a, a framework to work with. I don't know that there's any kind of overarching plan, that kind of detail when it comes to friendship evangelism and be, being invested in somebody as far as the how-to. It's a lot messier. It's a lot more just lived and shared experience. I wonder if you could speak to that idea of friendship evangelism and, and how it works and what we should know about it. Sure. Ha happy to do so. Um, and I wrote a small booklet called Unlike Jesus, Let's Stop Unfriending the World. Mm -hmm. And the point of that little booklet is that uh, Jesus uh, was a friend of sinners, and we often are not a friend of sinners. Uh, we watch Christian movies, listen to Christian music, and eat Christian casseroles, and have very little to do with lost people, mm -hmm. bottom line. And so in that little booklet, and also in Blessed I'm talking about developing significant friendships with people who need the Lord. I, there are two types of evangelism that I see. One is friendship evangelism, where we're developing relationships of integrity and trust with people outside the family of God. And then there's what I call single chance evangelism, where we see somebody on a plane or a bus or whatever, and we just have a, a one-time shot to share something of the gospel with them. I'm much more concerned uh, in developing significant trusting relationships with lost people. And they really challenge me to, to walk in a way that's worthy of the Lord. And I get into a lot of details in that little booklet, Unlike Jesus, but uh, that's very, very similar to what I've done in Blessed to say, what do we have in Christ and how can we share that with our lost friends? Do you, uh, do you find that if you have friends that are not believers who don't share your worldview, that that becomes a divisive factor in the relationship? And when those kinds of things come up, as with Mike, what do you say? How do you deal with it without breaking the friendship? I think that involves a great deal of investment and time into getting to know them. Uh, one of the chapters in that little book is we have a story to tell to the nations, but we've got a lot of stories to listen to first. And so I think we need to do a lot more listening than telling and earn the right to be heard. And uh, the mic that I referred to in Blessed uh, just the other week, my wife and I had the chances to spend a couple hours with him and his girlfriend. And, and we were really arguing for his soul. We were fighting for his soul. And he was bringing up every possible objection to Christianity he could think of, but it was done in a friendly way. I mean, we're still friends. And um, he and his girlfriend have actually agreed to read Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, which we're really excited about. So I, I think 
Friendship evangelism involves investing, developing deep relationships of integrity um, that when we can get into those spiritual conversations, we're not afraid to present the evidence for Christ and, in a sense, to battle for their souls. Do you think sometimes uh, we're living in a very uh, divided culture, and particularly so in terms of politics? In fact, I've heard numerous stories of families that have been divided, uh, can't even have Thanksgiving together because of politics. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you think maybe Christians ought to be a little bit less political and a little bit more relational? Oh, absolutely. Doesn't mean we can't have our political views, but I, I think of family gatherings, and, and all of us have family members that are not yet believers, and we want we want them so much to come to Christ. But I think there are times when we need to say to a family member privately, listen, you know I love Jesus, and I want you to come to know him, but whenever we talk about this, we get in an argument, and I don't want to fight about it anymore. I'm not going to bring it up anymore. But if you have any interest at all, I'm available 24-7. Now, let's talk about sports. What a good, what a wise statement. Maybe in a lot of different areas, not just the Christian faith, something like that uh, might go a long way to some kind of reconciliation. You know, the things we believe, and you pointed out in this book and in the book you wrote on hell, some of the things we believe are pretty hard. Uh, when you look at the negative side of it and the people that are not blessed by what we are blessed. For instance, you talk about how we've got the truth and biblical truth, revealed truth, revealed propositional truth. That's a great gift because everybody lies to you. But Christians are in a place where the God of the universe doesn't lie. And, uh, you know, in order to maintain friendship, And to do friendship evangelism, sometimes you have to say, you know, I could be wrong. I've been wrong on occasion, but but that's not true. And better you say it that way than, you know, you're going to hell. (laughs) And that's a lie. And I can't believe that anybody with half a brain could believe something that stupid. That probably would ruin the whole friendship thing, right? <laughs> well, I, I think if we talk about it autobiographically, it shouldn't. That's what I, would, I would talk about how that's what I deserve. Yeah. Hey, hey, guys, we're going to talk some more about this, so don't go away. The title of the book by Larry Dixon is Bless Ed. Professor and author Larry Dixon. Uh, thanks for spending time with us. By the way, have you downloaded the Key Life app yet? If you haven't, it uh, it's amazing. Uh, John Myers and some people here put that thing together, and they spent literally. We just didn't throw up an app. Uh, this thing was it took months to get together, and you'll love it. It's a great app. It puts the best of Key Life Org right on your phone. And if you go to keylife.org slash app, you might want to give that a try. Larry, I'd, I'd love to dig into the book uh, a little bit more. Um, and I know it's always a, <laughs> it puts an author on the spot because it's been so long since you've you know been uh, immersed in this. But the one that jumped out to me was the blessing of a godly routine. And I'm just such a big you know fan of of of, of establishing good habits. I, I don't have them, but I'm a fan of them. Um, <laughs> You know, if I get up early two days in a row, I'm like, I got this licked. This is fantastic. <laughs> I've I've arrived. So I wonder if you'd speak to us a little bit about what that means, the blessing of a godly routine. 
Yeah, I think uh, in many ways we grow in our Christian lives as a result of what I call holy habits or spiritual disciplines. And uh, I, I will be the first to admit that being retired sure helps. You can, you can do a lot Step more things one. when you're retired. But um, for some of us, it means going to bed a bit earlier so we can get up early and spend some time with the Lord. The one habit that I regret only starting a couple of years ago is praying every morning with my wife. And we've been married for 51 years. And of course, we would pray when, when a crisis would come. But uh, to pray every single morning now, almost without fail, it's part of our routine and we look forward to it and it starts the day right. And uh, I'm just grateful for that. But I, like any other habit, you really have to work at it to make it part of your, your life. We can let so many other things encroach upon our time and, you know, the, the urgent push out the important and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I think much much of our lives are based upon the habits and the disciplines that we establish. Mm -hmm. mm. We, um, I, I had a book come out recently and the uh, title was Laughter and Lament. And um, I learned a lot doing the research on that, on both the sorrow and the joy side. And was really impressed with how often laughter, a God who laughs, how often laughter and joy is central to where we are. You have a chapter on joy. Talk to us some about that. And I also have a, one of those chapters is on humor, different kinds of yeah. humor. On uh, how the world has us laughing at all the wrong things. Uh, yeah. But, I, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I, to me, that's a great life motto. I shared that with a, a nephew the other day who was going through some hard times. And I said, you know, I, you know, I'm a Christian and I, you know, you've not yet gotten to that point, but I'll tell you, the joy of the Lord can be your strength if you know him as your savior. So um, we, we live in a world sometimes in churches that are filled with joy killers. And I think we need to be aware of, of those threats to our joy and to me, that's why it's important to have a daily time in the Word where we get our joy from. Yeah, a good point. Larry, I wanted to go back to Matthew's question for just a second um, and the whole idea of structure and, you know, and discipline and all that kind of stuff. I have discovered within uh, in the last couple of years that uh, how easy it is to, um, about the time you feel like you've established a pattern with something, you know, you've done it for, as Matthew said, you know, got up early two days, but I mean, you really have a pretty decent pattern behind you of, of something, you know, something that you're, some things that you're trying to do and, and stay faithful at doing about the time that you, you get pretty confident in that is when you drop the ball <laughs> and you discover how quickly it is to take all of that that you've just that you've done that are good things um and, and just watch them fall right off the map again and and then how much more difficult it is to get back uh you know to get back to get back into it yeah i i agree and for for me that's one of the reasons i'm so thankful for my wife linda is that we we in a sense hold each other accountable for being in god's word praying together uh, doing various things that we think are important, but you're exactly right. It's it, it can be a habit that we do for a long time, and then some things just begin to 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 take away that time. And um, I think we need to be vigilant. And I thoroughly believe we have an arch enemy who hates us reading the Bible and hates us praying together as couples and hates us sharing the gospel or do anything in his power to mess us up. But there's also an internal enemy, and that's our own wayward desires where we establish our own priorities and forget to, to pursue the things that really please the Lord. So, yeah, I agree. You also have a chapter, and I'm not asking this for myself. <laughs> I'm asking this for Jinx. Okay. Uh-oh. This should be good. Uh, and uh, you have a chapter on a proper view of health. I mean, can should we get him to stop eating Doritos for lunch <laughs> every day? I think it has something to do with a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> Mind your own business, okay? <laughs> Quit meddling. Yeah, you're meddling. <laughs> Gosh. Talk to us about health. Yeah, only if those Doritos are kosher. That's what I would <laughs> there say. There you go. Uh, I've ordered been, some. That would be a callback. 
Um, I'm really thankful for God's grace in keeping me healthy right now. I play tennis about two or three times a week, and uh, I think it's important to have some kind of activity that we're doing. Uh, we're so prone, most of us are so prone to overeat and overindulge, and uh, I think in that sense, it helps to have others that are encouraging to us. Um, I recently did something with my, with my son called uh, 75 Hard. Uh, it's a 75-day program of uh, exercising two times a day for 45 minutes each and drinking a gallon of water a day. That's nuts. That's insane. A gallon of water a day. That's, that's hard. <laughs> getting a lot of reading done in the bathroom as you have to. <laughs> but, Better work uh, out in the bathroom, too. <laughs> yeah. 20 people enrolled, and each of us tossed in 75 bucks. And when it was all said and done, those of us that were left divvied up the money. So I wound up with $170. So I think that. But I dropped about 20 pounds as a result of doing it. And, uh, but you gambled challenges like that, you know, <laughs> you gambled. I hope you've repented of that. Good. <laughs> it was charity. He, no, 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 no. <laughs> he knew he was going to win. Hey yeah, exactly. guys, we're out of time. And I just, this hour is gone really quickly. Larry, I appreciate your taking. I appreciate your taking uh, our kidding and turning it back on us. <laughs> you know, laughter smells like Jesus. It really does. God bless you for your years and for the wisdom of this book. It's Larry Dixon. It's called Blessed. Uh, 52 weekly blessings you have as a believer and how to help your lost friends find theirs. Larry, I hope you'll do this again. Uh, thanks for being with us. You're thank supposed you, to say thank you, Steve. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Guys, we're going to back out, and uh, uh, but we're coming back with one quick, short segment in which we will describe the guest who will be with us next week. And uh, you, as always, will be amazed. Don't go anywhere. sit down and say, Lord, I'm not going to ask you for anything. Uh, I've got a list and you know it. Uh, and I'm not going to try to manipulate you or give you excuses for my sin. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit here and tell you how great you are and list the reasons I think that's true. I do that occasionally. I sound like a cynical old preacher all the time, but occasionally the spirit gets to me and I will sit down and do nothing, uh, but just tell God. And the way to do that is with his attributes. Tell God how great he is, praise him and worship him, and then say, let me give you the reasons. You, you never made me pay the full price for my sins. You have never told me I've had it with you. You have never turned me away, no matter where I've been or what I've done. Your love has never changed from the moment I first saw you. And you have kept me out of more trouble than I can possibly imagine. And once you start doing that, it starts coming. And then all of a sudden, you begin to see that praise is a gateway to power. And to joy. And uh, Larry Dixon reminds us of that in 52 different ways. But it's a lot more than that. His book would have been an encyclopedia if it had been exhaustive about this particular subject. Well, who's going to be next week? Next week, we can speak with great authority on this one because we actually already talked with this gentleman. Next week, Jerry, Jeremy Jobson is going to mm. be on the program with us, and he is a licensed counselor. And boy, did he give us some great insights. 
um, really, really some good stuff. He's a friend of yours. Yeah, he is. Uh, in fact, uh, I think the staff uh, invited him to be on our program because that was the only way they could get me to go to a therapist. Well, we were hoping that <laughs> he him to you. We were hoping that we're he would have help. to have him again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we work. met after it was over and said, "Nope, didn't work first time. Guess we'll have to do this again." We got to the end of the show, and Jeremy goes, "That's our hour." So. <laughs> Wait, no, <laughs> it's over, man. <laughs> In we fact, should have paid I th- double. I, I think he had, I think I heard him mumble something about, you know, this isn't fixable. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we're going to be back next week. Same time, same place. It's our fond hope that you'll join us. And between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't do. And that gives you a wide, wide berth. We're getting good at that. I know. <laughs> we ought to coordinate I'll say wide, wide bird, and then Matthew can say one, two, three, and we can all do the wide bird. Yeah. It's not a good one, it's a whole line of Or you could, say, you could say wide like this, and then Matthew could say wide, and then George could say wide. I got birds. <laughs>